Well, the scientific method teaches us that uh, we first uh, make some experimental observations and then we tell others about it. And it's then important that uh, other people repeat uh, what we have done to uh, verify the validity of the observations. And I'd like to say that I'm fortunate to have a, a, uh, uh, a loose collaboration with Dr. Uh, Joshua Lieberman at the University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine. And for several years, we've been exchanging some data. And uh, uh, I'd like to say that the uh, phenomena that I'm going to talk about have been uh, replicated in uh, Dr. Lieberman's uh, laboratory. And he finds the same kinds of things that I find. So uh, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, proceed to describe what we've been doing. OK, uh, biofields and bioenergy. Uh, bioenergy fields have been uh, asserted to exist for thousands of years and are the basis of many activities uh, today with energy healing and so on. However, uh, uh, scientific uh, scientists' effects to, uh, uh, attempts to actually detect and measure these biofields have generally failed, at least to the extent that biofields are are not accepted in the uh, mainstream science. This creates a problem because anything that you can't detect and measure cannot be subjected to scientific study. Well, I would say that the, in the, uh, all the attempts that I'm aware of uh, to detect uh, bioenergy fields, uh, they uh, are pretty much universally uh, photon de detectors of, of one form or another. But suppose bioenergy fields don't actually consist of photons, then uh, these detectors would be useless. So in this work, uh, the proposition is that biofields do not actually consist of photons, but instead consist of some form of energy that actually exists a physical force of some kind. That is, it, it can push against the physical object to alter its momentum. Uh, if you're going to detect a force like this, it's, it, uh, presumably it's going to be a small force, so we would need to have a uh, detection and measuring device that's quite sensitive. Uh, for this work, we're, uh, we're using torsion pendulum. Uh, torsion pe uh, pendulum, another term for torsion pendulum is a torsion balance because it can be used to uh, uh, measure forces with a exquisite accuracy. Uh, these types of balances have a long history in, in experimentation. One of the most uh, famous uses is Henry Cavendish, who used the torsion pendulum uh, to determine the gravitational constant. And even though he did this hundreds of years ago, uh, the value he came up with is within a few uh, percentage points of, of what's known today. Uh, this is a cartoon of the setup. I'd like to say that it, it's it's an utterly simple setup. The pendulum is, is as simple as you can possibly imagine. Uh, here is a subject seated under the pendulum. The pendulum excel, itself consists of a, of a uh, hemispherical uh, 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 energy receptor. I'll show a picture of it in a moment. And this is uh, uh, suspended from a support beam by a very short length of nylon monofilament uh, in most of the experiments, it's about 1.7 centimeters long, and the filament's about 0.7 millimeters diameter. It's a, it's a standard uh, monofilament uh, fishing line. Uh, the motions of the pendulum are recorded by a video camera. And <clears throat> I want to emphasize that when we're talking about a torsion pendulum, it's a twisting motion, you know, twisting uh, <clears throat> to the right and the left. It's not a swinging motion back and forth, but twisting <coughs> back and forth. So the uh, video camera is observing these motions. <laughs> Here is a picture of the uh, hemispherical energy collector. It's actually something I picked up at the hardware store. Uh, it's a food cover. Its uh, intended purpose is to uh, put over a plate of sandwiches and a picnic table to keep bugs off. Uh, we're talking uh, low tech here. It costs about $5. and 
and the uh, nylon filament a fraction of a cent. Now, to detect the uh, motion of the pendulum, I've attached a target, and it's a, uh, it's a piece of black uh, paper with a one centimeter white dot placed on it. So as the, as the pendulum moves, this white dot swings to the right and to the left. And uh, the uh, video camera is recording these motions. This is uh, a screenshot of an experiment uh, that's actually in progress. This is a baseline experiment. There's no subject sitting under it. And uh, it's, it's captured the, uh, the white dot at this particular position. Uh, you may be able to, to distinguish a, a uh, red circle in the, in the center. Uh, the computer program computes the position of the very center of the dot and draws a little red circle around it so you can uh, uh, convince yourself that it's actually looking at the center of the dot. And as this goes back and forth, uh, its motions are recorded on this chart in which uh, as it goes upward, uh, we're getting a clockwise direction of, of motion as, as it's going downward we're getting a counterclockwise direction of motion. Uh, now this uh, uh, video screen is, is something that I routinely, uh, during an experiment, the, uh, the subject will look at it. Uh, uh, so uh, that just so you know that that's what's, uh, what's being done. Um, now this is a very simple pendulum device, uh, does it behave in a classical fashion? This shows that it uh, behaves to near perfection as a classic pendulum. Uh, now this is oscillating back and forth in the air, so there's a substantial damping coefficient. So if you uh, set the pendulum in motion with a puff of air, it fairly quickly damps down. It takes about five or six minutes to damp uh, extensively. Uh, now, if you look closely, you'll see that there are two curves. Uh, there's a data curve. Uh, this uh, program uh, is collecting data at 10 points per second. So we get a very high resolution of the position of the white dot as it moves back and forth. So these are the data points, and this is the theoretical curve uh, plotted according to the classic equation for a damn simple, har simple harmonic, uh, harmonic oscillator. And you can see that the data curve and the theoretical curve uh, overlap to a very pleasing extent. Uh, now, the, uh, uh, we make extensive use of Fourier analysis because it turns out that the, uh, the frequencies uh, of the oscillation of the pendulum are very important. So we use uh, fast Fourier transform analysis to determine the frequency of the pendulum. Well, a pendulum uh, without a subject is, should have a single frequency, which it does, and uh, the, the pendulum is uh, 0.034 hertz, which has a period of about 30 seconds. And so this is pretty much uh, the pendulum that we use. Uh, I said that it, uh, it's a uh, torsion balance. Uh, <coughs> we can calibrate the uh, torsion constant of the nylon uh, filament that's supporting the pendulum. This is done by placing different masses on the pendulum and observing the effects of, of, the, uh, of the frequency of oscillation. Uh, the slope of this curve uh, gives the, uh, uh, the torsion constant, which is 2,249 centimeters per radian. Uh, using appropriate uh, conversion factors, you can, you can interpret this as, as meaning that it takes about 4.6 milligrams equivalent uh, force to rotate the uh, pendulum by one degree. So any force, any, if we have any effects on the pendulum uh, that cause the pendulum to, to rotate, uh, then we can get a, an accurate estimate of that. So here is the, uh, an experiment. Uh, now I have to say that as I've been doing these experiments, I, I, I'm continually astonished and amazed at the effects that a subject exerts on this pendulum. Uh, 
this, uh, I have to walk through this to kind of explain what this is. Uh, this is uh, subject one and uh, these segments, segment one, seg two, seg three, those are the periods of time that the subject is actually seated under the pendulum. So we begin right here at the beginning and that's uh, uh, the pendulum is set in motion by a little puff of air and uh, then I let it damp down and then when it gets uh, uh, fairly damped down, the subject very carefully is, see uh, is seated under the pendulum and then we collect the uh, data. Uh, these are the motions of the pendulum back and forth. And then at the end of the segment, the subject leaves and you see that it immediately tracks back toward the center line. So this is what I call the, uh, the center of oscillation. Uh, of the, the natural center of oscillation is this black line across here. And then after a period of time, uh, well these time points, this is about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, uh, various periods of time and maybe eight minutes in between uh, before the subject is seated again. And then here the subject leaves again and it, it rapidly goes back toward the center line. Subject is seated again and we see this. So uh, one of the most amazing things to me about these results is that when the uh, subject is seated under the pendulum, the pendulum actually starts oscillating around a completely different center of oscillation. I mean, this is like if you're watching a, a pendulum clock like this in the center of oscillation, all of a sudden it's going like that. It's quite astonishing. And it's not a small effect. You know, the, uh, you might think, well, this is a very small effect and it's highly magnified, but it's not small. Uh, because we have a, a torsion balance here, uh, here's a, a period of time in which this black line is the center of oscillation of this range here. And it would take a force that's equivalent to 34 milligrams to displace the pendulum by that amount. So, uh, uh, and the actual position of the displacement is 2.2 centimeters, which is equi equivalent to 7.3 degrees. These are not, not small values. You know, uh, we don't need statistics to uh, provide uh, convincing evidence that uh, uh, this is a real effect. Uh, this is segment two. I'm just uh, blowing this up so that you can really see the uh, oscillations in more detail. And you can see that the, here, the center of oscillation, it's, it's simply oscillating way off to the side. Uh, now here is the uh, Fourier analysis of segment two when the subject is seated under the pendulum. Uh, you see that this is, this is the frequency of the natural period of the pendulum and we see really dozens of new frequencies that are, are introduced by the subject seated under the pendulum. Uh, now, whereas each of these frequencies is simply detected during the period of time that the subject is under the pendulum, uh, using a feature of uh, uh, Fourier analysis, you can do a band pass and select out a particular frequency range and look at the dynamics of that frequency range throughout the experiment. So uh, this is the data curve that, I, I ha that we had in the earlier slide, uh, the segment two data, and this is the last slide showing the uh, uh, Fourier uh, uh, picture of all the frequencies. And so I've identified various of these frequencies and done a band pass on those peaks. And peak A here, you can see that the frequency here is not a constant intensity or amplitude. It sort of has a beat to it. it uh, uh, you can see it change. And peak B does the same thing, but with a different beat frequency. And C has many uh, beats in it. And D, very different. And this is kind of interesting. E is the actual 
uh, natural frequency of the pendulum. And it, that, that isn't constant. It's as if all of these other frequencies are actually overriding the natural tendency of the pendulum to uh, oscillate at a particular frequency. Uh, this is the frequency pattern of, of the three segments. So this is the same uh, subject seated under the pendulum, you know, for segment one and segment two and segment three. And you can see the uh, frequency analysis is of each of those segments. Uh, on the one hand, one sees similarities, but they're not identical by any means. So that it shows that the uh, uh, effects are exerted on the pendulum by the subject, uh, the frequencies are in kind of a, a, a dynamic state. And the actual uh, uh, effect on the pendulum is a consequence of all of these uh, frequencies undergoing uh, constructive uh, addition and, and destruction. Uh, so that accounts for the, the constant flux of the appearance of the uh, pendulum. Uh, now, without going back to that early, the complete experiment, one thing that is very striking is that uh, when the subject left the pendulum after the third experiment, uh, there was a lot of activity of the pendulum after the subject left. Uh, well, one of the uh, principles of the physics of a pendulum is that uh, if the pendulum is allowed to uh, oscillate freely, and then you disturb it with some outside uh, influence, uh, then the pendulum will incorporate that and behave accordingly. If you take that influence away, how long is it before the pendulum recovers? Uh, you can see that uh, it takes quite a long time for the uh, pendulum to uh, recover. This is, this is uh, the natural recovery of the pendulum, and this is what, uh, uh, what happens with, well, these, these effects are retained for a considerable period of time. Um, This is uh, the frequency pattern after the uh, subject departs, and you can see that uh, uh, the frequencies are not lost. So the, the frequency uh, remains, and uh, uh, this is taking out that large frequency, in the, uh, and uh, uh, you can see that many other frequencies remain. This is uh, subject two. Uh, similar kinds of things happen. This is a subject three. Uh, so it's not unique to a uh, particular subject. This is a fourth subject in which uh, all of these features uh, are seen. I won't, don't have time to go through the details. Uh, this is uh, the subject uh, frequencies when the present. This is after the subject is left. This is a control experiment, which I won't go through. Uh, alternate uh, materials. This is a cocoa fiber uh, uh, transducer. It has similar effects. And uh, uh, so conclusions. An energy field exists outside the human body that can be detected and, quanti and uh, quantified by its effects on these oscillations of a pendulum. Uh, In order to displace the pendulum in this way, it would seem that it would require uh, some kind of spiral vortex uh, in order to do this. Uh, contains many frequency components. The effects uh, on the pendulum persist for 30 to 60 minutes after the subject has left the pendulum. And it occurs with pendulums constructed of either steel mesh or completely organic fiber. Um, some hypotheses, I think we don't have time for those, so. Thank you very much.
Um, that's extremely interesting, and I suspect we'll have a few questions. Okay. Thank you. I found that to be a, a extremely valuable uh, experimentation and uh, opens up to objective verification this whole idea about energy fields around the body. Uh, I think it has great possibilities for diagnosis in medicine. I agree. And uh, uh, I gather from what you presented that uh, you haven't used this kind of thing with different patients. Well, uh, I don't have access to patients. Uh, I have access to volunteer subjects, which have been mainly friends and colleagues, and I run into somebody, one of them was one of my neighbors, uh, but about 20 subjects, none of whom have uh, any, uh, uh, any uh, pathological problems, disease states, you know, just normal subjects. Right. But the, the patterns that we see are, are basically universal. Uh, every subject shows these effects in various ways and in various degrees. Well, I'm quite intrigued with the, uh, the displacement of the center of, uh, of oscillation. It's incredible. Yes. Uh, and um, I would hypothesize that a, depending upon uh, the diagnosis, I'm a physician, so I can say these words. Uh, depending upon the diagnosis, that you would get a, a, a variation in that. Well, there is variation. Uh, I mean, with the same person, the variations in the displacement are considerable. All of the ones I showed, the displacement is always in the, is, was always in the clockwise direction, but uh, it, it, it's displaced in the counterclockwise direction also by the same person at different times. Uh, and it's, it's hard to understand why. Yes, perhaps you can talk together later. We do need to be efficient, so. Uh, really an elegant experiment. Well, thank um, you. It reminds me a little of the uh, Russian torsion fields that Kazirev and others have worked on. Others have commented on that. Yes. I, I wonder if there's something there. Uh, question, you may have mentioned this in your presentation. How did you make sure that you weren't getting electrostatic fields uh, producing some of these offset effects? Well, I, uh, I don't see any reason why they would be there. I mean, the electrostatic fields, I, I think, would be more likely with the steel mesh uh, detector. But the cocoa fiber detector, which is totally organic, uh, showed very similar effects. Well, um, I didn't really deal with that. Uh, I'm uh, delighted by the simplicity of your system and the elegance of your analysis. It looks like you have something that you can now test subjects in different states, different brain states, healers. Are you doing that? Have you? Uh, the next a little bit. I, it's. I've had a uh, one of the subjects. Uh, Subject one, in fact, uh, uh, is rather experienced in, in e e you know, interest in martial arts and in Eastern yeah, sure. medical practices. And yeah, for recruit. what it's worth, he has the strongest effects of anyone. Oh, yeah? But the okay. third experiment, the, the, you didn't uh, really have a long enough time. But the third person was totally was the only uh, experiment he had ever he had participated in, and the same things happened. So you don't have to be an adept or be talented in order to uh, exert these effects. Yeah, my name is Nuzi Hanif. I have a very simplistic question, maybe because I, of my ignorance of what you are describing. So the, the person who's sitting on the chair, they wouldn't be perfectly still. Maybe they're moving a little bit or something. Uh, so so well, I was wondering if you, if you, what if you placed a dummy that was not even a person and would be perfectly still? Anything I placed under it that isn't a person doesn't have any effects on it. I had a, uh, a control with a cooking pot that produces heat and, uh, you know, equivalent to what a person would produce, and it doesn't have any uh, effect. 
Hi, I'm Liam Gray. I really appreciated your experiment, and I'd like to try to replicate it, I think. I'd be I delighted to assist. Um, one thing that I'm hoping to start asking all the speakers is if they could estimate the cost of replicating the experiment. In your case, it looks like the, the five dollars for the that part is very cheap. But how about for your measurement apparatus and the the well, the uh, tools? it's uh, probably the most expensive thing is the support. I had to the, the support consists of two tripods, uh, which uh, and and then there's the camera, but it's you know a uh, Forty-five dollar, uh, you know, webcam works great, and uh, you need a computer. Uh, but practically everybody has a computer, and uh, the software is uh, not very. Actually, it's a uh, uh, it's a professionally written software program, so there is a cost associated with it, but it's not very great. Yes, uh, Dr. Hanson, uh, my name is John Reed. Um, it appears that your experiments. Uh, confirm some of the uh, theories and practices of, of ancient India because they had theory, uh, theorized that there was an aura field around the body and that there were several layers of, of energy fields around the human body. So that, that goes to some, uh, you know, in some way confirms not, that. Not to mention the torsional life, the, the chakras. Exactly, exactly. And they, in ancient India, they, and, and current practices, they used that field to make diagnoses, which um, uh, Dr. Blasband had mentioned earlier on. And, and I, I'm very interested in that myself because I'm a physician and uh, sure. I'd like to work or talk more with you about it later. I'll be glad to talk to you. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you.